that used to be a brothel, and uh, certain individuals had lost their lives there, and also that uh, there may have been some remains that were in the area. You know, there was other spirits that were around, but uh, it was a quick walkthrough. After that, we did some investigations in the house. There were multiple teams that were brought into the house. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, John was in that house, uh, Zaphis, uh, Mike Roberge. Uh, they experienced light bulbs. They were upstairs, the upstairs area. They came whipping around their heads at, at such a rate that they had to get out of the room. They felt that they were in danger at that time. Uh, photographs were taken in the house. Uh, red, what looked like red, uh, how can I describe this? Like red pillars of light were being filmed in the house. Sure. Um, streaks of white mist were being seen out in the yard uh, and inside the house. Um, phenomenon was just basically the same through the whole thing. You know, just hearing bangs. Uh, they would have um, flooding in the basement. There was all types of disasters that would happen in the house. So there was bad luck. I mean, every time, if something was going to go wrong, it did go wrong. And you'll find that in a lot of times with haunted houses or demonically infested houses. Things that just go bad. Um, but it culminated into an exorcism of the home. Now, during the exorcism of the home, uh, Bishop McKenna had gone all through the whole house and he blessed the family. And unfortunately, sometimes when you do this, uh, it may not work. It depends on the family. You have to have the cooperation from the individuals that are involved. She was very intrigued. She was, we didn't know this at first, but she was involved with, um, oh, it's uh, automatic painting. I'm sorry, it slipped my mind for a second. Okay. Automatic painting. She was actually painting images of these spirits that were around the house, but she was not conscious of this. And she, when we went to the, into this room and she told us about this, and this was about maybe halfway through the case, when we went in to this one particular room, we saw all of these drawings of these people, including that little girl she was talking about, but we didn't know about it at first. So this particular room wasn't one of the rooms that we went, that we, we thought that we had gone through the whole house. This was an upper room. It was closed. The, the, it looked like a closet door. It was a room that she, it was a small room which she would draw in. It wasn't a room that when we first went around taking care of the house that we even knew about. So this whole room was full of these paintings. Uh, not paintings, but the, I don't know what you call it when you take the charcoal. Not right, just charcoal etchings. Yeah, so charcoal, uh, charcoal etchings. And um, she was showing these, it was more like a sewing room. It was a very small door. Um, kind of strange. I'd have to, you, have to, you come up the stairs and you come around the corner and there's just this door. And you wouldn't even, if you didn't even... Because, like I said, we went through it the first time pretty quickly. We had Bishop McKenna come down, and we went through the house. But this particular room, just, we were never told about it. So this room here, she had the drawings inside, and uh, she was telling us about this. Now, her doing this was giving recognition to these particular spirits, keeping them there. Sure. And this, was going, this went on all the way to the end. This case actually went over a period of six years. We actually had a couple of uh, production companies that came in. Um, it, to try to uh, see if you know we can capture something, you know. And uh, this particular case here, she was okay. We we try to make sure that the person's okay with you know if we're bringing anything in filming, filming wise with a production crew or something like that. Um, she was okay with this. We would like to show the public if there's something going on. We brought in, I believe, it was Jane Goldman first, and then the Discovery Channel was, was the uh, the second production company that was brought in. But uh, another after that six year period of time, another exorcism was performed. I'm trying to race through this here. Another exorcism was performing, and it was successful. And they ended up selling the house after a period of time. But Well, yeah, you think when all these things are going bad, I mean, first of all, you, you want to get out of the house, but, I mean, do the families have concerns about the next family taking over, knowing what, what went on there? All their money's invested in it, too. Sure. You know, this is uh, this house, um, I should have said, it's, you know, it's dates in the 1700s. Okay. You know, so it was, a, it, was a, it, was a very, it was very expensive. I mean, she, she, uh, she invested a lot of money in this house. And the work that her husband had done to the house just added to it. You know, the yard was done very nicely. Uh, it, was, it was all landscaped. He just he put his heart and soul into it. But her, with that room, and with her making connection with this, it just keeps it there, you know. And sure. uh, you can have discord between the family. It doesn't even have to be something directly related to the spiritual. There could be discord in the family where even though you fix the spiritual problem per se, or you've helped them to fix it, I should say, it may be that there's something that it's that this spirit is attaching itself onto. It may be an emotion. A lot of times these spirits will work through emotions. So if you move to a house and you're like, you have some guilt upon you or you have something that's weighing upon you, like we were discussing before, if you're not feeling so good, emotional-wise, don't go into a spiritual place. Well, you wouldn't know it in your own given house until you were there for a while. Right. 
Yeah. Well, there's been a lot of people. I mean, we've even mentioned it on the show before. Some of the families that get along great. They buy a new house, move in. All of a sudden, they're fighting all the time. Things are going crazy, and they can't figure out why. And it's like the spirits that are there are agitating and irritating them and kind of feeding off that frenzy. If they're a human spirit, they may not want the person on the property. Uh, I mean, you hear stories. Uh, I heard a story one time, just thinking in my head right now. This woman was a caretaker of a campground. She was staying in this one particular cabin. She's laying in the bed one particular night. She can't move. All of a sudden, a gentleman walks in through the front door and starts to take things out of the cabinet, putting them down, reading the paper like he was doing in life, but he was dead. She couldn't move. Huh. I mean, you hear these stories where uh, you have a particular person come in. They, 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 they uh, act like as though they were alive. You hear somebody walk up a flight of stairs. But in this particular story here, he didn't want her to move. She actually was making gestures with her eyes. and I guess he saw her, or she said she, he, that he saw her. And uh, he put his fingers up, to, uh, his finger up to his lips, like shh. And when he was done, he left. And it seemed that she was bothered. It was he would make these visits, you know, at night. She couldn't move. Um, it wasn't like he was throwing her directly out. But after a while, she got the idea that he didn't want anybody there. And he wasn't really being mean about it. He just hmm. wanted to do what he wanted to do. And you know, they found out that he was a caretaker. And the other caretakers that were before her, the reason why they left was because of him. And they never said anything. We have to take a quick break. Our guest is Dave Considine. We do have a question from uh, uh, the chat. Uh, Martine Yvonne, it says in here, says uh, she'd like to know what the worst case is that you've worked on and uh, what's happened on that case. We'll cover that when we come back and uh, talk a little bit more with you. We'll have about another 10 minutes when we come back. Our guest, Dave Considine, stay tuned. There's more of the best in Paranormal Talk Radio coming your way right here on News Talk 100.3 FM. Good evening. Welcome back to the show. Darkness Radio is on the air. Remember, we'll be back tomorrow night with uh, supernatural news of the strange and bizarre with our own Mr. Timmy D. This evening, we're talking with our guest, Dave Considine. We're talking about some of the uh, cases that he's worked on and and, uh, his work on the Discovery Channel series, A Haunting. And uh, before the commercial break, I threw to you... um, uh, with a quick question from our, our uh, chat, uh, Yvonne from uh, Ontario, California, listening. She wants to know, what's what's been the most intense case you've ever worked on? And can you tell us a little bit about it? I would probably say the presence. I would say the California case. Oh, really? And that the was... The one that was presented on the A-Haunting program. And that, distance, that was in season two, right? I believe so, yeah. Okay. And that was because of the distance, because of what happened personally. I felt I, I have never felt so small in my life as when that, whatever it was, made a booming sound next to my head. And I, I didn't rise up slow like they present in that show. It was, it was immediate. I mean, I was just vertical that fast. But it felt as though I was a chess piece, as though something grabbed my shoulders and lifted me right up and just stood me right up. And it felt as though I was crushed. But I felt so tiny. I felt like King Kong picked me up. Well, tell us a little personal. bit about the case. It's like you know, just you feel so tiny. Yeah. Well, tell us what happened in the case. Can you give us some of the background on that? We have about ten minutes left right now, and I know that's again hard to put it all in a nutshell. But can yeah. you tell us a little bit about this case personally? It's past my bedtime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this particular case here, she was a young lady with two children, uh, one daughter, age of thirteen. Uh, son was around the age of seven. She it was the first time she bought her own house, and she was very proud of that. She didn't understand that the house, uh, again, had a history to it. But this history was a little bit more recent. Uh, she, the first, before I get into that, the first things that happened in this house after they moved in, at first, nothing was happening until a couple of weeks later. Now, the first one to experience anything was the daughter. The daughter would lay in her bed, and again, as that woman was paralyzed, she was paralyzed. She would see what looked like a young girl in a poodle skirt. She would stand by the doorway. Immediately, this girl was right by her bedside she would be on top of her within a second. Now, as she's on her, she's pressing down her on her body, and she's breathing putrid air into her face. But that's not the scariest part. She can't move. She has this putrid breath in her face, and the girl's eyes go to double their size. And she's staring her nose to nose. And then all of a sudden, it disappears. And this would go on uh, over a period of nights. Now, the daughter, I know this sounds kind of mean, but the daughter couldn't take anymore, so she switched rooms with her brother, not saying anything to anybody. Now, the brother didn't have the same experience, 
the brother was experiencing, what he had told us when we interviewed him uh, when we went there, uh, was that at first they appeared to him as small dwarfin-like creatures that were carrying what looked like buckets of paint, and they wanted him to finger paint. But after a while, they started to change, and they started to